can you run when you don't know the way of the Spirit? Oak House Church brings to you the word of life which is able to build you up and offer you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. Sit back and listen, and may your life become more like that of Christ as you encounter His Word. God bless you. Amen. If you are here tonight, if you're here in this room tonight, I'm very excited for you. I'm happy for you. I'm, I'm overjoyed for you. You won't understand this statement I've made right now. Maybe in another 10 years maybe in another 15 years, you will remember or you will understand and know why I said I'm extremely happy and I'm extremely excited for you. I was just like you many years ago when I was about your age. People came to my school to do exactly a project like this. So I'm a product of this kind of meeting in school on campus. I am that one life that Jesus touched as a young person. I'm that one life that Jesus changed as a young person. I am that one person that one day sat down confused, didn't even understand what life was all about. And somebody took the time to come to my school to share with me or to share with us what we're going to be sharing with you tonight. And amongst the many people that came that day, I and one or two other people came out and made a decision for Jesus. That singular decision has changed not just my life, but the life of thousands of people all over the world. My family and so many people have been touched and changed because I had an encounter, the kind of encounter you are about to have this evening. And that is why I am excited. I am grateful to God for you. I am happy for you that you came tonight. Your future, what lies ahead of you is great, is massive. If what you can imagine is beyond what you know. And I trust God that you open up your heart to the person that changes and transforms lives completely. If you're here, what it simply means is that God Almighty by himself handpicked you. And so when you come into meetings like this, you're going to concentrate. You're not going to look at your friend or your neighbor or talk to them. You're going to just have your pen, your paper, and your Bible. And you're going to concentrate because the one we are here that changes lives, the one we are here for, his name is the Holy Spirit, changes lives. He likes to be reverenced and honored. And so part of how we do that is it, this, it's not at this time we bring out our phones or begin to talk to our friends or we start walking up and down or we go out. You can't do that in a meeting like this, especially if you want your life touched, changed and transformed. You have to honor the one who physical eyes cannot see, but your body is definitely going to feel his impact. Hallelujah. Amen. So all you need to do is if you have your pen, you have your paper, you have your Bible, you bring it out. If you know you're sitting beside your friend that is going to talk to you and distract you, you change seat now. If you're going to sit beside your friend, make sure that, that your friend does not cause any distraction or tries to talk to you at all. You need to concentrate 150% if you want God to change your life. Are we in agreement? Okay, are we in agreement? Are we in agreement? I'm not sure I can hear you. Are we in agreement? Are we in agreement? Great Unilag students, are we in agreement? Okay, put your hands together for yourself. Amen. When I was outside, before I came in, I was outside for a while, and I saw some cars parked outside. You know, if you open any of those cars, any car you've actually ever seen, one of the things you notice if you open the bonnet of the car, some people call it a hood, some people call it a bonnet, just you open the front of the car, you will see all kinds of wires and knots and screws and all kinds of things in the, you know, when you open the car. When you see all those wires, the first thing that will strike like that a car is extremely complicated. A car is extremely complex. Not just a car, any machine whatsoever. Even this microphone, if you open it up, you see all kinds of wires and it will strike you that, ah, this microphone or any machine is very complicated and very, very complex. 
because it is complicated and complex, what it simply means is that not everyone can fix a broken car. You can't just randomly walk to a car and notice that the car is broken and start fixing the car. The reason is because the car is complicated. The car is complex. Even if you own the car, you are the owner of the car, you cannot fix it. Once that car is broken, it requires a specialist to work on the car. And the more complicated the car is, the more upgraded the car is, the more you need a specialized kind of person to fix the car. What that means is that, for instance, if you have a Tesla, Tesla is an electric car. I'm not sure they have it in Nigeria, but somebody said every single car is in Nigeria. Maybe, but there's no place to plug a Tesla car. So if somebody in Nigeria bought the car, what it means is that that car is parked in his garage. He will never use the car because the car goes by electric. He needs to plug it somewhere, and we do not have apparatus to charge electric cars. So, but let's assume it's a Tesla car. What it means is that even the person to fix it is not you have to go and import somebody from somewhere else to fix that car. Why? Because a Tesla car is more complicated than the normal Honda car. So the more complicated or the more complex a car is, the more the specialization of the individual that is going to fix that car. The reason is because that car is complicated, that car is complex. Guess what? Human beings are more complicated and more complex than a car. That means when a human life is broken, not just anybody can fix a human life. The, a random person on the road, or you and I may not be able to fix a broken car. The best many men can do, a lot of women can, the best many men can do, maybe fix the tire if it has a problem or whatever. The, just a the slight fixing they can do, but they really can't fix a damaged car. It requires a mechanic. And because human beings are complex and complicated, when your life breaks down, when anything goes wrong with your life, a random person can't just fix it. There's only one place that can fix broken lives, and it is God Almighty, using the instruments of the Holy Spirit. But the thing spirit is the same way with a mechanic. A mechanic won't just come to your house and start fixing your car. You have to tell the mechanic, my car has a problem. It needs fixing. That is exactly how the Holy Spirit is. He needs an invitation. If you don't know who the Holy Spirit is, at least you've heard about God. He does need an invitation to fix your life. So what you are going to do in one minute while you are seated, as you are seated, you're going to lift your right hand. You are going to tell the Father, I want you to fix every part of my life that is broken. You know, the thing is that you can have a part of your life that is broken and not even know. So I want you to tell God, fix parts of my life that is broken. Whether it's my body, my soul, my spirit, my mind, whatever part of my body is broken if you are in this hall i want you to just lift your right hand and say lord fix fix you know the parts of my life that is broken parts you may not have been able to share with anyone parts you don't even know are broken and need help but guess what the one that made you knows the areas of your life that are broken and where it needs help so tell him by doing that, by lifting your hand, by making that prayer, what you've just done is you've just given the Holy Spirit an invitation to walk on your life today. Remember I told you your Holy Spirit needs an invitation to mend a broken life. By praying that prayer, you have just given him the invitation that he needs to mend your life, to walk on your life. Especially if you prayed it sincerely. Tell him, you know me. You know the innermost thoughts. You know the things that are going on. I might not even know that I need fixing. The truth is most people don't know that they need fixing. Most people don't recognize that one part or the other of them are broken. So that's why you need to talk to God. The areas of my life that are broken, Lord, please fix it. Don't let me go here with any part of me that is broken. Don't let me leave this place with any part that is not complete. Make sure you're talking to God. Make sure you, he can hear you. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are the mender of broken lives. We give you the permission to mend every broken life, every area in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah.
Okay, let's break into it. Let's jump right into what God has for us today. Remember when I started, I told you that cars are complicated, but human beings are more complex and more complicated than a car. And I'm going to tell you why I said human beings are complex and complicated. The reason is because if you bring a car here now, you dismantle the thousand pieces, one million pieces, all of the parts of the car will be at this auditorium. However, when you are dealing with a human being, it's very different. All human beings have two parts, and you need to listen carefully. Every human being, there are two of you. If you are seated here, there are two of you. So a human being is broken into two separate parts. Actually, there are three in the strictest sense, but just to simplify it for this audience, just let's deal with two sides. So every single human being, there are two of you. There's a view that everybody can see. That is part one. The second part of you is a part of you that nobody can see. That alone makes you very complex. If a car is here, you can see all the parts of the car. And if there's any part broken in that car, you can immediately see it. But a human being has a part you can see. And then the same human being has a part you cannot see. Already, you're already a complex person by that. And the thing about these two parts of you is that the two parts of you can be having two separate experiences that have nothing to do with each other. The part of you that we can all see can be having one experience. The part of you that we cannot see can be having a completely different experience that has nothing to do with the first part of you that we can see. That again makes you extremely complicated. I'll give you an example. Somebody might be looking at me and, or looking at you or whatever. You can have a conversation with your friend and this happens all the time. And this must have happened like 20, 50, 80 times today to you. You're having a conversation with your friend and your friend says, Oh my goodness, your blouse is so nice. This is really beautiful. Lovely top, lovely hairdo. You look really nice. That's what the physical part is saying, correct? But in the mind of the person he's saying, what kind of rubbish hairstyle is this girl wearing? What blouse is she wearing? Who told her to wear this trouser? Is there anybody in her house that advised her properly? This girl is always wearing nonsense to this class. True or false? Does that happen? That means your inner man, the one we cannot see, is saying something completely different. The one we can see and hear is saying something completely different. The two of them, the same person, but you are saying two different things. So there is the, every time there are two of you, the part we can see and the part we cannot see. And all the time, the two of them are having two separate experiences. These things make you very complicated. Now, a lot of people pay attention only to the part they can see. This part they can see is called the body. So a lot of people see themselves only in the body. So they take care of the body, they feed the body, they clothe the body, they buy whatever. Everything they are doing in this life is for the body. Even when they are training their mind, guess why they are training their mind? Guess why you are in school? You are in school for the body. I know because you want to go to school, get a certificate so that when you graduate, you can either start a business or get a job and then they pay you salary or you make profit and you use it to either clothe yourself, buy food or a house or whatever, all to take care of the body. Because that's a part of us that we see and that is a part of what we are trained to deal with. And so we neglect the other part and honestly speaking, clothing yourself, buying food, all of those things you do to your body, there is actually nothing wrong with it except that there's a slight problem. What is a slight problem? The slight problem is this. There is a God. And he does not relate with your body. He relates with your spirit. Had it been there is a God who relates only with your body, then there'll be no problem at all if you take care only of your body, you feed your body, you clothe your body, you buy clothes, you do all those things you do. You go to school, you everything you're doing, there'll be no problem. But there is now a problem because there is a God and he's 
not view as a body, as a part we can see. God is dealing with the part we cannot see. And that is why if Jesus appears to you right now and says to you, how are you doing? Guess what? He's not talking about how is your body doing. He's primarily talking about what is going on on your inside. So he deals with you based on the part we cannot see. He deals with you based on the part you are neglecting. He deals with you based on that side you are not taking care of. You are not feeding. You are not clothing. You, are, you, you usually ignore that side. Meanwhile, that is a side God is very, very interested in. While we human beings are interested in the one everybody can see, God that made us is interested in the part of you nobody can see. And that is why the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 16, verse 7, he says, man, when they are dealing with other men, they pay attention to the body. But when it concerns me, I don't look at what men are looking at. I don't look at the body. I'm looking inside. I'm trying to pay attention to what is going on on the inside. While men pay attention to what is going on on the outside, I, God, I'm different. I pay attention to the inside. And so the Bible tells us that it is very possible, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, it's very possible for your outer man to be perishing. You can see. It is very possible for it to be having problems on the outside, to be perishing on the inside. Meanwhile, the one on the inside is growing. It is also possible to have the opposite. It is also possible for the one on the outside to be doing very well. You are fat on the outside. You are well clothed on the outside. But on the inside, you are sick. On the inside, there is problem. On the inside, you are broken. On the inside, all is not well. On the part of you that nobody can see, you are sick and something is degenerating on your inside. Meanwhile, on the outside, you are well clothed address all of those things are going on but the part you cannot see has a wound the part you cannot see has problems the part you cannot see is limited that part that you cannot see that part that you're neglecting is very possible that it has problems even though on the outside there seem to be no problem the thing also that makes you very complicated or makes it complicated about human beings being the fact that we deal with our outside and we ignore the inside is that whenever a person dies the part that goes back to God is not the part you have been taking care of you have your body if somebody, in fact when they say somebody dies what, what it means is that the part you cannot see which is your spirit man is separated from your body if they remove your spirit from your body you become useless Actually, the part that gives you value is not even this body. The part that gives you value is not even your mind. The part that gives you value, the part that makes you a human being is your spirit. How do I know? It is because when the spirit leaves the body, nobody will want your body again. Even your father that loves you. Even your mother that loves you. Would you want your father? How many of you love your mother or your father? Let me see your hand. Okay. Keep your hand up right? If you know you really, 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 your mother, put your hand up. Okay, keep it up. Mm. You love your mother more than anybody in this whole place. Keep your hand up. Or you, uh -uh, I see some people putting their hand. <laughs> okay, you love your dad more than everybody in this whole place. Keep your hand up. Okay, we're well, sure you love your father, your mother. Okay, you don't have your father, mother, but you love your husband more than any other person. Lift your hand. I uh -uh, see on the hand. Okay, you love your boyfriend more for some people. Okay, but you get the point. You love your mother and father more than anybody. Keep your hand up. Okay. You see that your mother and your father that you love very much. What if the spirit is removed from that your father? Would you want that your father near you? Maybe after a day, you manage it. By the 48 hour, how many of you who love your father and mother will want that your father near you again? No matter how much you love your father, what makes him valuable is the spirit. The moment the spirit is removed, that body becomes useless. Actually, the body, you know when somebody dies, the body goes back to where it came from, which is the dust. 
The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, the spirit returns to God. Actually, yesterday I saw an obituary, a lovely obituary. Not because I know the person that died or whatever, but I love the caption. Normally, they will write glorious exit or gone too soon or transition, whatever. But this is the first time I saw somebody who really understood life. You know what they wrote about the obituary? They said, returned to the maker. They really got it. They say returned to the maker. They were not talking about the body because the body returned. Yeah, the body returned to the maker. What is what? The ground. They were trying to tell us in that poster that the spirit has returned back to the maker or returned back to the owner. That's what happened. And so guess what? That part of you that returns back to the owner is a part we neglect. Is a part we don't pay attention to. That part that will remain on the ground, there are people that have died. If you go open the ground, after 24 hours, our person starts decaying. After about a month, the body becomes sand, and then all you have is skeleton. But that's the part we are taking care of. That's the part we are feeding. The one that is going to return to God, the one that is going to last forever and ever, that will never die, is the spirit, and that is the one we don't take care of. And that is one God pays attention to. And that is one, when I talk to you, God is not hearing what I'm saying with my mouth. He is hearing the things I'm not saying with my mouth. God is paying attention to my thoughts, to my motives, to the things going on inside. But you, because you're a human being, you pay attention to what I'm saying on the outside. Remember, the body and the spirit, they can be having two separate experiences that have nothing to do with each other. I'll give you an example. When you go to school, you go to class, you went to school this morning or last week or whatever, you went to school. Do you know that when you sit down in a class, you are being educated, correct? Why you are being educated? You might say you're educating your mind, but like I said, at the end of the day, you're educating your mind to take care of your body. You're just educating your mind so that you'll be able to graduate from school, get money, still take care of this, your body. So at the end of the day, you're educating your body. Do you know that when you sit in a classroom in University of Lagos or Yabatek or any school, when you sit down there, you are educating your body. But guess what? Your spirit man is sitting there, not receiving an education. That means you physically educated but you are a spiritual illiterate. You don't know anything about the spirit world. You don't know anything even about the Holy Spirit that lives in the unseen world. You don't know anything about spiritual things yet you are physically educated. Meanwhile this life is spiritual. So you go to school for 15 years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever, 40 years. All of that time you are sitting in a classroom. You are only educating this one we can see. What is happening to the spirit? Whenever you go to a class, they are not educating your spirit. They are educating your body. Stay for six years in a secondary school. Stay for another four to five, six years, depending on your course in a secondary school. And all of that time, your spirit is illiterate. Your spirit did not receive any type of training. Your spirit did not receive any type of education. And that is why you find it difficult to relate with God. Because though you have learned how to relate with men, you do not know how to relate with God. And so many times we relate with God as though we are relating with men. And so we find it difficult to have a good relationship with God. Because God is not man. And you relate with him very differently. So whenever you go to school, which part of educating? Your body, the part you can see. Now, let me explain something about educating the body. So that's what happens in the classroom. When you come to meetings like this, when you come to church or you come to the presence of God, something starts happening to your spirit that did not happen when you were in class this morning. What is that? Your spirit man, that part you cannot see, starts receiving an education. Unfortunately, and it's important I put this caveat out there, unfortunately, sometimes, many times we go to church, and the church, rather than educating your spirit, is still educating your mind and your body, telling you how to make money, telling you how to dress well, telling you how to get a job. They are 
same thing your classroom is doing. They are not educating your spirit. So you see a lot of people, they are grown up, but their spirit has not received an education. So but when you sit in meetings like this, something is happening to your spirit. You are receiving an education. Your spirit is being trained. Your spirit is being taught something that a natural man that you can see cannot teach you. In fact, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit will take a pen and begin to write on the table of your heart. He's teaching you something. He's penetrating into your spirit and he's talking to you. He's training you. Now, I'm about to give you a spiritual education. And what I'm about to tell you right now, 85% of young people do not know this. So that means... If you are able to understand by your spirit what I'm about to say, you get into the 15% of young people that know what I'm about to tell you. Just want to educate your spirit, man, just a little bit to give you an advantage in life. The same way that when you are physically illiterate, when you are a physical illiterate, right, you know you go, you're going to be disadvantaged in life. You can't even communicate properly. You obviously won't get a good job. You're obviously going to struggle through life. That's the same way. When your spirit is not educated, you are going to be disadvantaged in life. Let me help your spirit to receive a little bit of education today. I'm about to do and I'm going to show you something in the scripture. Are you ready for that? Because I want to help you educate your spirit man. So here's my thought. Do you know that 70% of your core beliefs are wrong? Let me say that again in a way you will understand. Do you know that 70% of the things you think are true are not true? Let me say that again. Do you know most, let me say it in a better way. Do you know that majority of the things you think are true are not true? Do you know that 70% or more of the belief system you have is not true? The things you believe are true, they are not true. Let me say it again. 70% of your core belief. Do you know what a core belief is? Something you believe to be true. That's what a core belief is. And core beliefs are very important. Do you know why? They determine what you will do or not do. I'll give you an example. One day I was in a taxi. Not here. I was in London. I was in a taxi. And as I was, the taxi man was taking me, actually was taking me to the airport. And then he started some small talk. And he says, where are you from? I said, oh, I'm Nigerian. He said, oh, really nice. Very, where is Nigeria? I said, it's in West Africa. I said, oh, that's nice. I'm from Afghanistan. Eh? You are from where? He says, it's from Afghanistan. And immediately, my whole system went upside down. I said, eh, Afghanistan. Hey. All my red flags went up. I started thinking, this man must be a terrorist. There must be a bomb in the boot. Hey, this man. Oh, my God. I now took my phone to send a text message to people I know that in case you hear bam, just know that it's this man. I started thinking, eh, let me find this scene well. Maybe there's a bomb in the boat. I now started looking at him to see his head shape, to see whether he's using start talk to anybody on the phone to say, yes, I'm about to bomb somebody in the car. Why was I having that thought process? Because I have a core belief that everybody from Afghanistan is a terrorist. Is it? So the moment I heard Afghanistan, before I was normal, low, he was talking to me, I was replying him. The moment he said, I'm from Afghanistan, immediately my entire system changed. When I got down from taxi at the airport, I said, Father, we glorify your holy name. Oh, Jesus, we thank you. Father, we give you great praise in the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, you are above all. Why was I giving God extra thanksgiving? Because the person that drove the taxi was what? And Afghanistan. And I have a core belief. I have a mental thought that everybody that is in Afghanistan, they can't be normal people. They are all terrorists. Where did I get that information from? From what I'm watching, from what I can hear, from what people are saying. Let me give you another example. If that, I think I saw a two-month-old baby, a small baby. If that baby sits here and a snake starts coming towards the baby, what do you think the baby will do? 
What did baby will do? Will he run away or play with it? He will play with it. Why? He doesn't know that snakes are harmful. He thinks it's a toy. He won't run away. If the baby sees a lion, what will he do? Nothing. If the lion runs, the baby will get up and dance. True or false? Why? Because of the core belief. But I'm about to tell you now, most of the things you think are true are not true. And that's a problem. How about if you're living your life based on things you think are true, yet they are not true? Do you know how dangerous it is to play with the snake? Why is it dangerous for the baby? The baby doesn't know that there's a problem. So he plays with the snake because he has a core belief that everything is good. Everybody is good. So that baby is in danger because of his core belief about the snake. Now, let me explain why I had to differentiate between the part you can see and the part you cannot see. But I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you are slaves? If you know you are a slave, lift your hand. Okay. Let me ask again. If you know you are a slave, lift your hand. No hand is going up. The reason is because you are only seeing yourself as a body. There are people that their core belief is that they are not slaves. That's a problem. Because if you are a slave and you don't know you are a slave, you won't fight it. You won't fight to be free. So because you are treating yourself only as a body, you forget that there is a spirit part of you that nobody can see. Is it possible that there are other forms of slavery apart from the physical slavery you are thinking about? Actually, there are nine forms of slavery. And I'm about to show you. Everybody here is slave to one of these nine things. Two of them are good. The remaining seven are not. You may not be able to see handcuffs in your hand, but there are people that are seated here that are slaves, and there is nothing that hinders a man's destiny more than slavery. Nothing hinders you more than imprisonment. Nothing. Because when you are in prison, you can never achieve your goals, your dreams, the purpose of God for your life. You won't be able to achieve them until you are out of there. That is why people, I think that is the worst thing for people in prison. Abroad, if you see they are prison, you too, you wonder why they are complaining. They have plasma TV. Some days ago, I was watching one woman in prison and she was complaining. Meanwhile, she was on a treadmill. This big giant, not this fake treadmill they have in Nigeria. This big expensive treadmill. She was on the treadmill, she was jogging, she had music and all of that. And then come and see the food they were giving them. I say even rich men in Nigeria cannot afford this one. Yet you are in prison and you are eating this thing and you are still complaining. But the question is, why were they complaining though they had a good life in prison? The reason is because no matter how they treat you, as far as you are a slave, as far as you are in that prison, you can never fulfill all your goals and dreams. You are automatically hindered. Nothing hinders a person in life more than slavery. So I'm going to show you the nine types of slavery. When I'm showing you, you'll be checking yourself to see which of these ones am I a slave to. The first is what you know, physical slavery. That's why you did not lift your hand. Physical slavery. But Jesus was telling us something in uh, 32. He said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And the people like you, they made a comment. They said, we are not slaves to anyone. How can we be set free? That's because they too, like you, were thinking all slavery is physical. Like you, they were thinking all forms of bondage is physical. There are many people, you may never see handcuffs in their hand physically. But in the realm of the spirit, their spirits are handcuffed. You may not see it physically. That's why I said human beings are complicated. Because your physical body, the part we can see, can be having an experience of freedom. But your spirit man is having a completely different experience. Is in handcuffs. If God can open your eyes, you will now look inside and see the spirits of men that are bound. 
men are hindered because they are bound. That's what the Bible says to us when Jesus was talking, when Jesus was giving his vision statement. He said, one of the things I came to do is to set the captives free. Which captives? He wasn't talking about those in physical jail. Because in all the story of Jesus, we never read once that he went to jail. Even when his cousin John the Baptist was in prison, we did not hear he went to jail. We didn't hear he went to prison. So obviously, he wasn't talking about physical captives. He wasn't talking about physical prisoners. He wasn't talking about physical slavery. He was talking about another type of slavery that men are involved in. But they don't know. So they don't fight it because they think all sin with the eyes. They think all forms of bondage must be seen with the eyes. So the first time, like I said, physical slavery. I don't need to explain all that one to you. You already know physical slavery is when a person can't go anywhere. He can't exercise himself. He has to be in one place. Somebody dictates when he eats. Somebody dictates when he sleeps. Someone dictates everything. That's one type. Number one type of slavery. The second type of slavery, I'm going to run through the nine very quickly. And then I'm going to show you how to be set free. So that you are no more hindered in life in the name of Jesus. If you are a slave, if you are a prisoner and you walk out of this place still in handcuffs, not too many people are equipped to deal with your case. The same way not too many people are equipped to fix a broken Honda. Not too many people are equipped to fix a Tesla. There is actually only one place that is equipped to deal with slavery. And I'm going to tell you where that place is now. Who that place, person is. So the second type of slavery is what is called demonic bondage or demonic slavery. I'll give you a few symptoms of it. Some of you have those symptoms when you sleep. You have all kinds of experiences. You have those experiences. You have those experiences. You sleep, is it that someone is pressing you, or you see yourself eating, or you know, all kinds of things, unexplained situations and circumstances are going on in your life. Sometimes you have a dream and somebody is chasing you, and you notice in your family they struggle so hard. Nothing, you can't really say that this family is flourishing. No, there's slavery involved. If you look at that family, they are the type Jesus came to set free. Jesus told them something. He said, the reason I came is to set the captives. Some people are bound by demonic forces. In the physical, the police are not here to hold you. But in the spiritual, you are in, you are in a spiritual prison. If you go to Kirikiri or whichever police cell, you might see people in prison physically, but they have been delivered and so Though they have physical slavery, they are bound, in the spirit they are free because they've gone through a process. So physical slavery is one. The second one is demonic slavery, demonic bondages. And there are ways people get involved in those things. Some of them is because of what their parents have done. So they've gotten themselves involved in fetish practices or their father or their mother got them involved in fetish practices or by different things they've done, they have now become slaves because they've opened their life. The reason you became a slave is because you continue to sin and you opened up yourself to that kind of slavery. And so for some, it manifests in different things you do. If you, before you enter this university, they struggle that you struggle. It's not that you're not smart. It's not that you're not intelligent. You read. On that day of exam, something went wrong. To write your name, you couldn't remember. Okay, that first time is okay, it's a mistake. Second time again, the same thing happened. Third time again, the same thing happened. For some of you, you have elder ones, but you are the first and only person to go to school in your entire family. Let me, go, let me continue, uh, because I want to mention all three. And the third one, apart from the money bonded, the third one, they all kind of link. The third type of slavery is when a person is a slave to sin. You are a slave to sin. That one is pretty clear. Let me tell you what happens to you. You want to stop lying, but you can't. You're a pathological liar. You want to stop stealing, but you can't. You want to stop living in pride, but you can't. Why? You are a slave. You want to stop gossiping about people, but you can't. Why? 
you are a slave. In the physical, nobody can see any handcuff on you, but you are a slave to gossip. Some of you want to stop talking too much, but you can't. You are always talking. I was with somebody recently, the person can talk. The lady talked and talked and talked. I started praying. I said, Holy Spirit, who will deliver me from this lady? And she was with her elder sister. She talked and talked and talked and talked. Said so many things. My head was aching me. And then the same person said, I know I'm talking to the elder sister. I said, ah, you talk too much. She said, I know I'm talking too much, but I can't help it. That person is a slave. She'll say, okay, okay, okay. I'm going to keep quiet now. I know you are tired. I'm going to keep quiet. I'll say, Father, thank you for answered prayers. She'll say, ah, do you know this car? She continue. I'll say, Holy Spirit. In fact, I bind the spirit of talking. Father, close her mouth. After some time, she'll say, okay, okay, okay. I know I'm talking to you. Even my mouth is paining me from talking too much. One second later, she'll start again. She is a slave to talk at you. Some of you, when you were coming to school, you say, ah, all these bad boys I hear about in school, no, I will be a good boy. I will be a good girl. I'm not, I'm going to be a virgin until I graduate. In fact, I'm going to make first class. In fact, the moment I, all I'm doing in school is from my hostel to, to class, back to the library, this is what I'm going to do. So I can make a first class. That's what many of you said. It didn't even last three months. You already had a boyfriend. Not because you want to, but because you are a slave to sin. I read a scripture. If you have your Bible, you can help me turn to Romans chapter 6, verse 16. There's a translation called New Living Translation. In that translation, um, how many forms of slavery have I given you? Three. This is the third one, right? I remember what I said. Nothing hinders a man more than slavery. When you are a slave to sin, the first thing it will hinder you is that God cannot use you. Number two, of course, your eternal destiny. You have a destination eternally. You want to stop it, but you can't. This is beyond you now. You want to stop, you can't. So read the scripture, Romans chapter 6 verse 16. That scripture says, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to do? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death. Meaning what? There are people here listening to me. They are slaves to sin. And they cannot help it. Today, you are going to be set free in the name of Jesus. If you are not set free... And you allow that sin to continue in your life. The Bible says that that sin will lead you to only one direction. It is called what? Death. So let's take a look at the fourth form of slavery. The fourth is what is called financial slavery. Many Nigerians are here. Most people all over the world. The financial slavery. Let me tell you how it manifests itself. You walk and you walk and you walk. And not just today, people listen to me online. This is how you know you have financial slavery. You walk, 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 walk. Either number one, nothing to show for it. Five years later, nothing to show. Ten years later, nothing to show. Fifteen years later, nothing really to show for it. Or you actually have something to show, but whenever there is, whenever you have money, whenever something good is about to happen, something comes and steals it away. Yes, I was listening to the story of a young man who is very wealthy, but he's sick. He sold all his houses to treat himself. At the end of the day, after selling all his houses, he died from that same sickness. He's a financial slave. Some people who labor, at 60, they retire. They are still begging for food. There are so many things that are here. Financial slavery. You can't help but buy, buy, buy. Or you are covetous. Or you can't explain what happens to money that enters your hand. You know your father worked hard for that money. You make up your mind. I'm going to conserve this money well. Somehow you can't explain why you never have. When you have, is it that stolen? Or there are some of you, they are always stealing your property all the time. No, there's a problem with your finance. 
There are people that are slaves, financial slaves. They will never all their lives work for people. There is always a problem. Sign of God. Okay, let me quickly run through the other ones so we can get in some action tonight. The fifth one is emotional slavery, soul tie. There are people that are emotionally bound to other people. So this man, you go and date somebody, you get entangled in your soul, you know this person is bad for you, yet you continue. I watch a lot of crime. The only TV I watch, if it's not news, is crime. Simply because my husband says, I don't know why I like, like watching where, where they are killing people. But why I like watching crime a lot is because I like, I'm very mental. I love thinking, right? So I like watching how they will see that they killed somebody. There is no clue. There is nothing to show who killed the person. They'll just come on the street. Somebody is dead. No clue. I like the thinking pattern. How did the police think through and finally arrest the person? Sometimes 20 years later, they'll come and catch you. That's what I like seeing. Now, I was watching um, crime, one of the crime teams, and they showed about a, a young lady. She's a pastor's child. So you better listen carefully. They were showing her in prison, and they wrote under, she was sentenced to 100 years imprisonment. So I was like, ah, pastor's child. 100 years. How? They didn't even say 40 years. 100 years. And then they were interviewing the lady. She said, I got into prison at 14. Now I'm 25. And then she made a statement as if she saw my notes. She made a statement. She said, by the time I get out of prison, I like her faith. So they sentenced her. She's 17 years old. Meaning she's graduating when? She's coming out of prison when she's 100 and... No, 100 and... No, she has said she's 25 now. She entered at 17. She was sentenced to 100 years imprisonment. For some reason, she still believes that she's going to come out. And then she said, by the time I come out, I will not be able to accomplish my goals and my dreams. So I started watching. How did this lady, a pastor's child, how? So she said, of course, she used to go to church. She used to read her Bible. And her father was her role model. And she said, my father, uh, he lived what he preached. So I became more interested. So her father is a real pastor, not a fake pastor. So how did a pastor daughter end up in jail? Guess what happened? When she got to school, she said she noticed a young man. His name is Spencer. And then the man was like a bad boy. And so she was attracted to him. She used to wonder, who was this man thinking about? So somehow she got close to the man. They started hanging out together. Her mother didn't like it. Her mother said, I harass her. Stop being and hanging out with this unbeliever. She refused. Before she knew what was happening, she started dating the unbeliever. She got entangled with the unbeliever to the extent that she would sneak that unbeliever into her room at night. So one day her mother entered the room, saw the, the, the Spencer fellow. What are you doing here? Shouted, shouted, shouted. Told the man to get out. The, the girl to open her mouth and say, It's my house. It's not your house. You don't pay the rent. It's my house. So the girl said, I'm going to follow Spencer. She said, okay, your choice. She left. When they drove to the car park, she said she fell asleep. When she opened her eyes, the Spencer had a gun. And she said, he said, we're going to teach her a big lesson. We're going to teach your mother a lesson. Now, what surprised me, said, is as if she was spellbound. She said she knew what the boy was doing was wrong, but she couldn't correct him. She didn't want to hurt his feelings. So I now sat up to watch very well. They drove to the house. The Spencer told her, knock on the door, let your mother come out. So the Spencer hid by the door. The lady knocked on the door. Quack, 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 quack. The mother said, yes, what do you want to pick some clothes? She was saying in that video, she knew what the boy wanted to do. But she didn't want to upset him. Her soul had been entangled. He said, I was in love with Spencer. Immediately, the mother opened the door. She entered. Spencer entered. Say, pull the gun and say, you dare drive me out of your house, you stupid woman. He pinned the mother down. She said, I could only stand by and watch. I couldn't stop Spencer. Her soul had been entangled. Spencer tied her mother's hand because they do this dramatization. 
tied her mother's hands and legs. The mother was begging, please don't do this. I'll give you all my candles. I'll give you all my money. You don't need to do this. You don't need to do this. Please don't kill me. She said, I couldn't stop Spencer. I stood by and watched. He said, I couldn't do anything. Even me, I wanted to enter the TV and slap. I couldn't do anything. What happened to picking up your phone and dialing 911? At least if it's in Nigeria, you die one one, they won't answer you. But abroad, if you die 911, in two minutes, somebody is there. You can't say you couldn't do anything. But guess what? She, her soul was entangled, just like some of you are entangled. You know the boy is bad for you. You know this girl is bad for you. You know the girl is leading you into lesbianism, but you can't break free from that relationship. Your soul is entangled. You are a slave to a relationship you have no business being involved in. So Spencer shot and killed the girl's mother. The mother did nothing. The girl did nothing. Eventually, police traced, arrested both her and Spencer and sent 100 years imprisonment. Guess what Spencer died, did? Spencer now committed suicide. So she's even angry with the Spencer for killing himself. But the point is, how did a pastor's child get there? She was a slave. That time she said she was bound. She couldn't do anything. You can't see the chain on her hand physically. But that lady was bound in the spirit. Tonight God is giving you an opportunity. When she was getting entangled, did she know it would lead to physical slavery? No. Some of you, when the opportunity comes for you to be set free, listen, you see that bondage you are in, it has only one destination, physical and spiritual death at the end of the day. That's what happened to that pastor's daughter. A good girl at 17. Her dreams and hopes cut off for life. Because of soul tie. Entangled with the soul. With the heart of an unbeliever. Somebody, my, my unbeliever means somebody who doesn't respect the Lord. Let's go to the next type. Mental slavery. That's number what? Number six. Mental slavery. This one is your mind tells you. You must do this. You're, you're addicted. You feel, I can't do without this drug. I can't do without this cigarette. I can't do without this particular thing. Let me tell you how you know people are slaves. Even on the packet of the cigarette, they write, you know the drink. Okay, let me ask. How do you know what they wrote on the packet? Let's start from there. Advert, okay, I forgive you. Cigarette smokers are what? Yet, people are still smoking. Why? Slavery. Addiction. Have you ever heard that uh, marijuana makes people crazy? Have you heard it before? Okay. But are there people still taking marijuana? Why? Slavery. Marijuana slavery doesn't begin the first day. It begins by being connected with the wrong crowd, just like that lady. You become connected with the wrong crowd. Instead of you to extricate yourself early, you get entangled with the friends. You don't know how to say no anymore. You have the feeling that it will look somehow if I tell them I'm not going to go to a wild party. It will look somehow if I tell them that I don't want to drink with them. You do it until addiction comes. Some people are addicted, slavery, mental slavery to uh, um, pornography. One day you went and watched a bad movie that God said don't watch. You watched it. From that day, that image stayed in your head. So you are bound. So every time you find yourself in masturbation or pornography, you are sitting in class, but your mind is not there. You are seeing all kinds of images. You are addicted some people sitting here addicted to drugs. Some addicted to cigarette smoking. Some addicted to masturbation. Some addicted to all kinds of things. Some addicted to sex. Already at 17, 18. You are addicted to it. All kinds of things. It is a form of slavery. So in the physical, we can't see the chains. But in the spirit, that side we cannot see at all. That side, there's a chain. There is addiction. Just like spiritual bondage, some of you are bound to spirits, demonic spirits. That's why you're seeing all those things and manifestations in your life. And you are blessed that you are young to hear this now. It's easier for you to get free and live free. Because the more you stay in slavery, the more difficult it is to come out. So while you're sitting there, 
you're here, don't worry, next week. Don't worry, next one. No, it's a lie. The more you stay bound, less easy it is for you to come out of it. So how many have I given you now? Okay, let me tell you the seventh and the eighth one. I'll tell you the seventh one. The seventh one is slavery to the flesh. A little bit like slavery to sin, slavery to the flesh. What does that mean? Anything your flesh wants to do is what you do. You are a slave to the dictates of the flesh. If you're writing Romans chapter 7 verse 14, does a good explanation. So this one says, the things I want to do, I cannot do them. I want to be a good boy. I don't want to disappoint my father. When you were coming to school, your mother said, your father said, remember the son of who you are. In those days, you used to walk. These days, even though your father said, remember the son of who you are, you don't care. At least in those days when we go to school, you don't want to disappoint your father yourself. So the Bible says, the things I want to do, I can't do them. Why? You have become a slave of your flesh. Even if the spirit says pray, you can't pray, you sleep. If your spirit says fast, you can't fast. You do what your flesh wants to do. If somebody annoys you, the spirit will say, forgive. But your flesh will say, don't forgive. You become a slave to the flesh. Whatever your flesh wants is what you do, not what Jesus wants you to do. So I look at the eighth and the ninth one. These are the two that are very good. If you are not a slave to number eight and number nine, you are definitely a slave to number one to number seven. It is only these two types of slavery that can set a man free. The eighth one is slave to righteousness and the ninth one is slave to God. Though they look alike, they are slightly different. What is the difference? Being a slave to God, you are a slave to a personality called God. Meaning that whatever God tells you to do, you do, whether you like it or not. And you are happy doing it. Apostle Paul said, I am a bond servant and I'm glad doing it. And enslaved to righteousness are the acts God tells you to do. So the two are the same, but they are slightly different. The same way sin and flesh are slightly different. So these are the types of slavery. The first one I mentioned, or rather the second one I mentioned, is slave to sin. When a person can say no to sin, when a person can say no, I choose to follow Jesus. When a person knows he's living in sin and he cannot stop it, when a person knows this life I'm living is not good, Yet, you cannot stop it. That person is a slave. Like I said about demonic bondage, there are some of you sitting here, you are bound by demonic entities. And so they've held you and even your family captive. And the Bible tells, I'm going to tell you how to get yourself free according to the scripture. Let me tell you what Paul was teaching us. He said in verse 24 of Romans chapter 7, he, he began to talk initially. I see there's no projector, so I'm just going to read it. He began to talk initially. He said, the things I want to do, I cannot do them at all. And then in verse 24, he said, oh, what a miserable person I am. He said, who will free me from this life? Eliminated by sin and death. He now gave the answer. He said, thank God the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what the Bible says. He said, thank God the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. Which means there is only one solution to slavery. The Bible tells us it is Jesus Christ. When a person runs to Jesus, already freedom has come. When you are a young person, you run to Jesus early. What happens to you is that the rest of your destiny is guaranteed. And it's not just running to Jesus. It is staying the course. It is being sold out completely to Jesus. As I'm going to tie this, I'm going to tell you my own personal experience. When I was in school, I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus. And something happened to me. I actually changed. I, I recognized I was a sinner. I heard the gospel. I heard the preacher say, you are a sinner. And I knew. I'm not necessarily such a bad person. But I knew I'm a sinner. Something is wrong with me. The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing it. Something is wrong with me. And that day I broke down and I cried. And I came to the altar. And I gave my heart to Jesus genuinely. Something happened to me. I knew I changed. I had a deep love for God. I had a deep passion for Jesus because that's the first thing that happens to you when Jesus enters. He changed my life. My has changed completely. All 
I wanted to do was to serve God. And then, of course, I joined the church. I, became, I started as, a, um, what do you call this, with a sweep, from sweeping. I joined the choir. I led a cell group. I was sold out. I used my entire days in university serving God, going from one campus to the next, preaching, planting churches, praying for the sick, winning souls, all of that. My whole life, I threw it into following Jesus. And then I graduated. And then finished my youth service, did my postgraduate diploma, and then I got a job with an international company. And the Lord said, no, I don't want you to take that job. I have something else for you. So I let it go. Years later, in 2015 to be precise, I was invited to speak at the United Nations in New York. And when I went there, when I got there to speak, when it was almost my turn for me to talk about employability, a few people, you know about it. I asked the Lord a question, and I've repeated this story many times for a reason. I asked the Lord a question. How did I get here? How am I on this platform, United Nations, to address people? I am not the most intelligent Nigerian, obviously. I am not the finest Nigerian. This is a position presidents are looking for. Highly placed people are looking for. How then am I? I was less than 30 at the time. How then am I standing here? No, I think about 31 or ish, something like that. How am I standing here about to address people and talk to them about youth unemployability? How did I get here? Let me tell you what the Lord answered me. He said, when you were in school, campus, you heard the gospel, you believed it. You gave your whole life to serve me in school. Even when that job came, I told you not to take it. It was a juicy job. It was a good job. You let it go just because I asked you to. You didn't grumble. You didn't complain. When they gave me that job, the alternate job, God said, I want you to work in church. They were supposed to pay me 2,000 naira per month, which they never did because the church couldn't afford it. You left that international opening. You did what I asked you to do. He said, that day, you chose to obey me, even though you looked stupid. He said, that day, I made up my mind to put you on the highest platform on planet Earth to speak. That day, I reserved this position for you. It's the same thing I do for anyone who will serve me wholeheartedly. And he said, this stage is just the beginning of what I am going to do with you and for you. The Lord did not lie. Many years after that opening, what the Lord has done in my life and blew it. And it's all because I met a man called Jesus Christ. Many years ago when I was very young, there's a lady that came to my school to talk. Her name was Pastor Bimbo Dukoya. When they called her to speak, she was telling us about how Jesus changed her life and all the things that happened to her. And she made a statement. She said, just because I met a man called Jesus Christ. And I wondered, how is it possible that just because you serve Jesus, he's going to do all these things in your life? Many years later, I'm here to testify to you. Just like Pastor Bibo told us that day. Just because I met a man called Jesus Christ. He has changed my life and the trajectory of my life. And the things he has done. I don't want to stay here and start listing different. Is it financially? Is it in my family? Is it even in my career? There is no area where I'm lacking. Is it even in education? I'm a graduate of three of the most prestigious schools on earth. Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, all to the glory of God. Spoken on the highest platform. What people are craving for, God gives to me, are on a platter of gold. Just because I met a man called Jesus Christ. And just because I committed wholeheartedly to him, 
just because I served him as a young person, just because of that action, Jesus took an oath to bless me. Started first with spiritual and after some time began to translate to other things. It is at this stage where you are where I made that decision that changed my life completely. And I'm about to give you that same opportunity. If you are here and two things I'm going to add. Number one, you recognize I am a slave. Nobody's seen any slavery on my hand, but I know I'm one of these slaves. I'm going to give you an opportunity. One. Two, you recognize I do not have a relationship with Jesus. I am not born again. And Jesus gave us a command. He said, listen to me, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'm sure you know the scripture. Serve God, not when you are old. When you are young, the person that created life, he knows why he says, do it when you are young. Let me tell you the honest truth. A person that serves God young and a person that starts serving God at 30, they are not the same thing. They are not on the same platform. Let me say it again. A person that starts serving God at 30 and a person that starts serving God at 40, they are not the same thing. They are on two separate platforms. The older you get, the less it counts before God. Why? You have used your pride to count. Then you now want to dash God, the remaining of your tired self. No. They're not the same thing. A person that commits to God at 12 and one that commits to God at 20, they are two separate things. They are not on the same platform. The earlier you make a commitment to Jesus, you have set up yourself for success. When I mean success, I'm not talking of you buy car, you buy shoe, you buy all those useless things. You don't have to be born again to be successful. I would lie to you. You don't have to be born again to have clothes, shoe, and bag. I'm always having clothes, shoe, and bag. What Jesus will do for you is to, number one, give you what money cannot buy. Then, he'll give you what money can buy. Hallelujah. So, if you are here, you are a slave to sin, and you know any of these slavery I've called one, two. Ah, you look at yourself and say, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I don't. Let me tell you, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I can predict your end. It's not a good one. And if you're here, you're thinking, oh, don't worry. When I graduate from school, I'll have more time. Then I don't have books to read. You are joking. As those that are working, it gets more complicated. If it is now you learn how to serve God, it's not when you now have a job. Is now. This is the best and the easiest time. It is the discipline you have that will now transit when you now get a job. If you didn't have that discipline when you were young, when you now have a job, it becomes hard. You are not able to make the right choices. I work with people who are working. I see the kind of choices they make. Wrong choices. I don't blame them because they didn't start early. If they started early, they will know how to make the right choice for Jesus. There's nothing you put before me that will make me sacrifice my commitment to Jesus. Even when my body is ailing me, even when I'm weak, if Jesus said, do this, I will do it. Why? I started that discipline early. So by the time I came out of school, it was easy. If you think, don't worry, when I, I know, if you don't do it now, you are not as valuable to God as when you are 40. Mm -mm. The earlier, the better. If you are 9, this is the time. If you are 12, this is the time. If you are 20, this is the time. If you are on campus, this is the time. I guarantee you, if you don't make a commitment to Jesus, when you graduate from school, you are going to make the wrong career choice. 100% guaranteed you're going to make the wrong career choice. You will be guided by everything else except being guided by God. And that is why I told you at the beginning, I'm excited for you if you are a young person and you are hearing this. Beyond today, my team and I want to hold you by the hand and help you on this journey. 
So it's not just a today thing. I understand what it means as a young person in the 21st century to serve Jesus. That's why we're going to hold you throughout this journey until you stand and you are mature. Ten years later, you will stand like me and you will tell them, a lady came to my school with her team and they finished preaching and that lady said, these things have happened to me because I met a man called Jesus and that lady did not lie. The same way I'm here to testify, Pastor Bimbo did not lie when she said, I met a man called Jesus and he changed my life. That's the same way too. A few years later, you're going to stand to say, I met a man called Jesus. He changed my life. And that is why I'm here today. Because of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to give you that opportunity to guarantee the rest of your destiny. And I'll tell you something else. You may go to church after this, but you may never have the opportunity to give your heart to Jesus. Because many times in churches we preach, we don't give people the opportunity to make their heart right with the Lord. So this is the time. Maybe you're even in church, but you're just a pastor's child. You're just a pastor's child. You don't have that personal work with Jesus. So on the outside, you are okay. On the inside, you are sick. You are the one for tonight. I want us to stand to our feet. I want us to stand to our feet tonight. As I give somebody the opportunity of making your ways right with the Father. With God. Right with Jesus. And I'm going to make that call and I'm going to ask you to come quickly to the front. If you are here, for whatever reason, you are not saved. You are not born again. One, two, you've noticed that I'm a slave to sin. I want to end it now. This is the time to come very quickly. Very, very quickly. I want you to join me in front. I want you to join me in front if you're like that. Wherever you are, from the back, the front, the side, come to the front. Come to Jesus. You're coming to Jesus. You're coming to Jesus. Keep coming wherever you are. Come to Jesus. Mm -hmm.